in the 21st century, the changes that human beings will see is equivalent of the changes that we've experienced in the past 20,000 years. So if you look at it, basically for one in one generation, the changes that we will experience is as much as from the days of the uh, Egyptian Middle Kingdom until today. So that's the kind of world that we need to get our uh, youth and our students uh, acclimated to because that's the kind of world that they're going to be living in. Because the changes that we're seeing are not linear. The changes that we're seeing are exponential. And, uh, and exponential change is not something intuitive. Uh, so uh, it's not, uh, you know, if you look at most um, technology companies, it's not, uh, when they hire uh, staff, they are not only looking at what they know, but more importantly, how fast they can acquire new knowledge. Because whatever they know, most of that is going to be obsolete soon. We are in, a, in an environment that uh, the content and the availability of content is not an issue. But of all of the content that we have, what are the particular pieces that will be needed to solve a particular problem? Yeah, so the students and the methodologies that could really use very effective learning processes and develop algorithms that can uh, optimize that process are going to be the ones that will be most successful. So that's how learning has to change and uh, learning has to evolve. Because of the abundance of knowledge, universities are not the only sources of new content. You know, you mentioned the Khan Academy, Sal Khan, I've known him well, I have a lot of respect for him, as well as Sebastian Throne of Udacity and Anna Agrawal of uh, MIT edX. But I think all of these individuals collectively created new platform for content delivery. But in addition to these, if you look at foundation, when we look at national labs, when we look at public broadcasting, when you look at uh, national libraries, when you look at theaters, all of these are sources of new content. So the more of these contents are available to everyone, now when faculty have access to these, they can choreograph their classes for their particular needs of the students, so students will have access to all of this information in addition to what they can do locally. So the role of the faculty member still remains quite paramount and central in the learning process. But the faculty member would be spending more of the time on how to choreograph the material for the students and concentrate on how learning occurs and what are the type of analytics that they need to look at to make sure that students are really learning rather than be very preoccupied with content production and content delivery. Well, the, the potentials, uh, in my view, are only limited by our imaginations. Uh, the potential is tremendous. And how can we find an algorithm that will get us from point A to point B far faster is going to determine from a successful institution versus not so successful institution. So that creativity and that passion to uh, look at new ways and never in look at our jobs that uh, to look at them that they are never finished. It's always a work in progress. That's how I think we develop that. Uh, uh, cultural temperament to continually improve and continually find new ways. And as part of that one, not only will we be able to do some incremental changes, we'll be able to do some uh, breakthrough changes as well. You know, the breakthrough for me would be that we would be able to migrate from a lot of this compartmentalization of education, that we have the K through, you know, uh, elementary, K through 12, community uh, or vocational, technical, college and then uh, continual education. How can we really look, look at all of this as one continuum of an eco, uh, educational ecosystem where content is provided by many entities, where learning happens in a more social and contextual way, uh, where it's the open me, people and students can move through this not based on a particular fixed time, 
but based on their capability, interest, and passion. Uh, so it the learning not only becomes individualized, but the pace becomes also uh, quite individualized. And one of the responsibility that uh, we all have, uh, specifically I think in universities have, to, to have a strong debate and dialogue about those situations. You know, not to you know, accept, uh, look at everything as a panacea that every one of these technologies will move us forward. So and this is where I think the strength of a university is because dialogue and, and debate and, and healthy level of skepticism is so fundamental in a university. So look at a lot of the negative factors because if we do not, somebody else would and some, and some of those uses would come. Uh, so I think you know, those aspects should be looked at. Those aspects would always be with us. Uh, but I think not engaging is not going to help us because the technology is moving. Others will use it for good purposes and maybe not so good purposes. But if you re re do not remain engaged, we cannot really protect ourselves from some of those downfalls and some of the negative impact of that. So I think we have to remain engaged and identify what are the areas that can really help us and what kind of a safeguards we need to build.